So here is a clip, just a brief clip from the first episode, I believe. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's take a look at a typical day at Atari and the atypical characters of which that day was comprised. There used to be more hair. <laughs> <laughs> typical day would be, I would be one of the first people in and I would wake Rick Maurer up, who had fallen asleep from working all night the night before. He'd be lying on the computer terminal and the keyboard and wake him up and send him home. He'd go stumbling into your office around 10 in the morning, and typically you could spell marijuana feeding out from the other offices. I walk into the morning and try to find out uh, who, uh, are there any dead bodies around? First of all, <laughs> you know, uh, did anybody get into trouble overnight? Is there anybody in jail? Uh, yeah, that's, that's in the morning. I mean, check the police blotter. And code, and how do I fix this bug? Typical program would be uh, and then a couple hours later, go around to Crony and smoke a joint on the way to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't the sense of a business like everyone arrived at a certain time and left at a certain time. And everybody sort of had their own schedule that they fell into. I would stroll in around 11 o'clock or so in my shorts and tank tops and flip flops and Go and uh, go get my coffee and then work on whatever project I was at. Sit down and do some work and eventually someone would come over and start playing your game and you play it back and you start having different features and brainstorming and you go play somebody else's game. Uh, to me, the most productive time was always in the morning. A lot of people would get into later. And I was never a person who stayed terribly late. I know that the janitorial staff comes through around 3 in the morning and they have a key so you can lock them out. So you have to take the little rubber wedge and wedge it under the door so that you can get a few hours sleep. When I was working on projects, I would tend to fall into whatever schedule of uh, that the engineer that I was working with was doing. So, so if they were coming in at 2 and leaving at you know, midnight, then that's when I would come in. Then you go into the game room and check out some of the arcade games and let off some steam. And go back and think and work. You work until uh, wee hours in the morning. <laughs> Get in the car with Dave and ball up and join. There were like two kinds of days at Atari. One kind of day was just long drawn out real like solving bugs in the code and <laughs> kind of the, the boring side of the uh, uh, game development process. And then the other day was an event day where there'd either be someone like Spielberg going through or the Disney people were visiting or people from the children's television workshop. That was what was so exciting about Atari is that we got to meet a lot of really famous people we got to brainstorm with them. Here was Steven Spielberg. Got to play my game with him. He loved it and asked for the first one. It was it was uh, pretty amazing. I remember going doing Muppets, um, going to New York to meet the various people who were Jim Henson and Chris Surf, and we got taken out to Twenty One. So that's uh, once upon Atari. I actually became a uh, video and film producer. 
so that I could do this this thing because Atari did such a number on my head. It was such an intense place to be. I needed to tell the story. I needed to do something to do that. And this is still the only piece of media about Atari that's produced entirely by people who actually worked on the 2600 and did games at Atari. So I was always very proud of this. So, and like I said, that'll be. I'll have those upstairs. I'm doing the autographs later if anyone is interested in getting them. And I'll autograph them. No additional charge. <laughs> But working at Atari was an amazing kind of experience, and it was a very strange thing to do, uh, because it was so atypical. And I really, I always felt bad for the people who came to Atari straight out of school, because this was their concept of what working places are like. <laughs> and uh, I had worked at Hewlett Packard, I had worked at a multinational corporation for a while, and realized how boring most workplaces are. And so when I got to Atari, I really kind of appreciated it. I always felt bad for the people who thought this is just normal. This is just the way like this, because Atari was not normal. There's nothing ordinary, and it, and it didn't make sense a lot. What I always used to think is that when you, when you start, when you expect things to make sense, you're really losing touch with Atari, because it was an amazingly nonsensical environment, and it had to be. Because, you know, this was pioneering a new medium, which means we have to break rules that don't exist which is a weird thing to do. And so, what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was the idea of science versus art in game creation. Because they're both present in game creation. A video game is a technical product. You know, it is a computer program with code that all has to work. It has hardware that's constrained, that has to be appeased. and but it also has this additional piece of the spec, which is that it has to be fun. So after you do all your technical work and everything fits and works and there's no bugs and it's all set and functioning, you have this additional problem of it has to be fun. You have a totally subjective criteria in something that's a totally objective, typically, in depth, which is programming. Programming is not a terribly subjective activity, typically. So there was the science of making the program work, and there was the art of doing something that was just fun, creating a fun experience. And it's an interesting hybrid, because there, you find different kinds of people doing it. Uh, in the previous panel, we were talking, we had some home producers who were talking about it, and you see there are people who come at it from a technical standpoint, and there are people who come at it from more of an entertainment or fun standpoint. And there are two different equally valid ways to approach, okay, because there are games that are super technologically elaborate and advanced that suck, right, <laughs> that they're not much fun to play, and there are some super, like Tetris, how complicated is Tetris technically, right, Tetris is a game that can be done on virtually any hardware that has ever been developed for video games, it's a very simple implementation, but how fun is it? It's a super compelling, addictive gameplay. So that's what you're going for. And so you have some people who are more tech heads and some people who are more creative types. And you know, where do you find, where's the balance? Where's the middle point? You know, most people lean one way or the other. Some people lean far enough to fall over, which is not uncommon at Atari also. So that was always fascinating to me, the idea that people could choose what they're going to do, because you could focus on making a program and having a technological innovation, which we all did. We all wanted to find some cool technique and a way to put something on the screen that you hadn't seen before that would be like, oh, cool, something that was neat. But that's a mechanic, right? That's a piece of the game. A game has to be an overall experience where all the pieces come together in a way that's a pleasurable experience, right? Because something that's cool on the screen is cool for a couple of minutes, and then you've seen it. Right? For a game to really work, it has to be for hours, if not days. And it's a different challenge. And that was what was cool. And it's right, it was the challenges. There were things we had to do that nobody knew how to do. Atari got super successful, right? It took off like a rocket. It was the fastest growing company in American business history. Which is an awesome achievement. 
And it largely happened because nobody knew what was going on. It was something that was already set, the fuse was lit, and it took off. And at the same time that it was taking off, the whole management team changed. So that created a whole class of people who believed they were responsible for the success of Atari, who knew nothing about running this business. So it was kind of ironic because shortly thereafter it became the fastest falling company in American business history. So that's pretty weird in the space of a few years to be the fastest growing company in history and then be the fastest falling company in history. And when you're the fastest growing company in history, it's easy to take credit and say, look what a great job we're doing, and this is fantastic, and there it is. When you're the fastest falling company, people go, okay, fix it. Run into what I call the Matt Hubbard theory, the Matt Hubbard uh, postulate. Matt Hubbard was a guy who was a programmer at Atari who then went on to Activision. And he had a saying that I always, I never forgot, I always enjoyed it. He said, the definition of state of the art means when it's broken, nobody knows how to fix it. <laughs> and it's brilliant. And it's, and it's true. And so what happened was when things started to go bad at Atari, everybody started to get cotton mouth. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, nobody knew what to do. The people who, were, who had taken credit for making everything work didn't know what to do to fix it because they hadn't really figured it out. Nolan had created you know, a company that was based on a really cool, innovative hardware that got together, and even he didn't really know what he had. And I believe that's a true statement, and here's the evidence for that statement. He sells Atari for like 22 million, when in about two years it's going to be worth almost half a billion. And he may not be the greatest business person in history, but he's certainly not the worst. And I don't think anybody makes that deal if they really know where it's going. But nobody knew. Nobody knew anything at Atari. That made it a very exciting place and it made it a very scary place. Because some days you come in and it's just amazing and my game is going well and things are exciting and I can't wait to see what's going on. And then sometimes there were royalty days where big checks were going to be handed up. Those were cool days. But there were also days where you'd come in and there was uh, some really ugly political infighting and things were going on and you weren't sure if you were going to have a job by the end of the day. Because you hear rumors that something's going on and something big is happening. Uh-oh, here it goes. Those are some huge ups and downs to go through on a regular basis, and that's what we did at the time. So, going through experiences like that made me a therapist. <laughs> so, like I said before, I'd love to get to the Q&A with this. Do you guys have any questions for me in general? Yes? Um, I heard a rumor that once on Atari was going to uh, possibly then be turned into a Hollywood movie at some point? Um, is it in development hell? I mean, it seemed like with the popularity of shows like Silicon Valley, it's ripe to get like basically a movie version of Atari, which sounds like Silicon Valley circa 1982. Great question. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah, yeah. The question is, is it Once Upon Atari going to be a Hollywood property? And no one's ever asked me that question. And the truth is, Multiple times it was going to. This is the thing that was going to be. Because you know what? There's one thing about Once Upon Atari that people in Hollywood absolutely love. You know what that is? It's the title. <laughs> That's what they love. Once Upon Atari is a very clever name and people love it and has Atari. But because it has Atari in it, there's trademark issues and stuff. So uh, quite a while ago, uh, you ever hear Goldie Hawn? Okay, so she has a production company. She's not just a pretty actress. So she has a production company run by her kids, and I had a deal with them. I had an option deal with them. They were going to make Once Upon a Target, and they were going to make a made-for-TV movie for NBC, and it was going to be like this two-hour commercial for the documentary, and they weren't going to do anything with the documentary. They just wanted the rights. They were going to buy the rights to basically the title from me, and then I was going to be on the side. Maybe I would have had a cameo somewhere or something. And they were just going to write up a story and do this at Once Upon Atari. And 
This was uh, shortly after, uh, what was it, uh, the Atari rights had been purchased by Infogrames. Okay, and then they changed their name to Atari. They actually wanted to do the whole thing. Do you guys remember this when Atari, Atari rights keep floating around, right? Infogrames, a French company, bought them at one point, and they had them at this point. And so NBC and this production company goes to Infogrames and says, we want to make basically a two-hour commercial for your product that will be on national television. And we'd like to pay you a couple million dollars to do this. And they said, no. <laughs> and I'm like, what? They said, no, because they said, well, no, this is going to be about like sex and drugs and rock and roll. And we don't want our product, video games, associated with that. <laughs> and I thought, these people do not understand their product. <laughs> And within the next two years, their stock lost 95% of its value. And then the Atari rights traveled on somewhere else because they weren't managing it well. But it's interesting, but you see this. You see crazy stuff that goes on. And then there was another time where uh, a company, maybe you've heard of them, called MTV. So MTV, uh, was all set, we were negotiating this thing, and we had it all set up, and they were going to buy the rights from me, and they were going to make their story, and they even had a, a director, a guy named Mike White. You ever heard of School of Rock? You know the movie School of Rock? This is the guy who wrote School of Rock, and he played Jack Black's buddy in it. He was already signed up to write and direct this movie, and that looked really good. And I was thinking, this is great, because I'm going to get paid. <laughs> going to make a movie, and I was, I was very excited about this prospect. But you know, Hollywood is a fickle place. People think Silicon Valley is a fickle place, and they are right in many ways. But Hollywood is the original fickle place. And so what happened was Paramount, like literally days before we were going to finalize this deal, Paramount bought MTV. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about the inside Hollywood workings. I didn't. I found out the hard way was that a lot of times when one company buys another company, the first thing they do is cancel all their projects. Because we didn't start those projects. That's got to be crap. That's why we bought it. It was to get rid of everything you have. And bam. So that was the end of that deal. So I'm still waiting for the next one. Occasionally, they're still, you know, you get ticklers here and there. But great question. Never heard anybody ask me that before. So yes, it's happened a number of times, and yet has not happened. Yes? Great crowd, great questions. So, I'll be happy to answer that question. I hope that will make you happy. Because there's a, there's a great point I like to bring up about game design. It's very interesting. Because when I did Raiders, you know, I did Yars, and then I really wanted to do another action game sequel. That's what I wanted to do. So, I finished Yars, and I was all set and had a design for a Yars sequel. And they go, oh, wait, well, we want you to do another game, adventure game. So, okay, so Raiders of the Lost Ark doesn't sound like a bad idea, and I got to meet Spielberg with it, and that was cool. But and when it comes to doing the game, there was two problems that I saw. The first one was adventure, the game adventure. The game adventure is an awesome game, genre-defining, huge, huge thing. I, I know I've talked about this before. It's, it was intimidating to try and do something that was going to stand on the shoulders of adventure, because adventure was so huge, I felt I had to do something really huge to make it a step forward. So it was intimidating, the idea of doing it. Uh, the other thing is, is adventure games, when it comes to designing games, there's a fundamental difference between an adventure game and an action game. And that difference is this. In my opinion, a well-designed action game, the designer can have exactly the same play experience as any other player. Right? You shouldn't have a whole bunch of tricks and little things that you know about that nobody else knows about. You should have designed an, inter an engaging play, and if it's just an action game, you play it just like anybody else does, which means that when you 
are testing your game and working with your game, you can gauge the play experience, right? I know what it's like to play this game and, and see what it's like. With an adventure game, with a puzzle game, with any kind of game where you have to figure things out, the person who makes the game can never experience what it's like to play the game, right? So, and that's an interesting factor in this. When people who do adventure games, people who create the puzzles and put that stuff in, they never get to experience what it's like to play that game. So the only way you have to tune it and engage it is to have other people play it, and, but as soon as someone's played it, well, they can't do it again, so you have to get other people to play it. And the idea of gauging, is it too tough, is it too easy, that's a much harder process in an adventure game than it is in an action game. But I decided to take on that challenge, and I just set out to make what I thought would be the biggest adventure game on the 2600, not in terms necessarily of the number of screens, but hopefully in terms of game experience and varied experience and you know the ins and outs and also follow the through line of the movie. And so that's it. So it's up to all of you guys how that went. You know, how well that, that did. But that was it. And then when I finished Raiders, I said, okay, now I'm gonna do this your sequel thing. And it's oh no, no. It turns out there's this other game we need, and we need it in five weeks. <laughs> and, you know that story. Right? So I did that. And pretty much by the end of ET, I'd say, uh, in all honesty, I was burnt out. And so I didn't really do anything for a few months after that. And then I started playing with the R sequel, but I kind of threw out my original design for the R sequel I was really hot for. And then I started playing with some other stuff, and it wasn't really working, and then I kind of went in and out of that and let go of it. And then eventually I did come up with a, a sequential action game that I was pretty happy with, which was Saboteur. And that was going well, and was almost all set to go. And that was like an action-adventure kind of thing. I was trying to mix the two. And, uh, well, it was just about ready to go. And they go, oh, wait a minute. We're going to get the license for 18. Why don't we, why don't we take Saboteur and convert that to 18? I said, okay. So we changed the graphics, tweaked the play a little bit. That's one of the main things with graphics, like Mr. T. So we made a giant Mr. T head. And that was your character. And that was kind of a weird thing to do. And so we played that for a while, and then they go, oh, you know what, we're not going to really do the AT. Let's go back to Saboteur. Okay, so we'll do that. And we went a couple of iterations of that, and then Atari closed. And that was when the Tremels bought it, and basically no good was going to come of anything after that, game-wise. The yeah, SD was okay, but I was gone. So that's, that would be the seat. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. One question about, when you talk about the culture of Atari, um, how did you see that play out in the industry once Atari was gone? If you look at, say, Bungie or those of the newer games, do you see a lot of Atari culture there, or do you see it coming on in the future? Uh, depending on how you define Atari culture, yeah. Atari, Atari, culture permeated the entire valley, not just the games industry, in my opinion. Atari, you know, there were 10,000 people at Atari at its peak, okay? And we were all pretty into what was going on. It was a very intense place to be, but it was a fun, it was a wild place to be. Also, the idea of developers as like rock stars. The idea that developers need to get paid and they need to be facilitated as opposed to whipped <laughs> and just told what to do was uh, that was a mentality that started to permeate, percolate throughout the valley. So that aspect of the culture, I think, did pass on to other companies and you know a lot of technological development. Uh, however, the real wild and crazy, out of control aspect of the environment, where engineering is kind of wagging the company. And that became a huge battle. I don't think that really persisted. I mean, there's always been perennial conflict between engineering and marketing and management. There's always been that. And that was existed before technology. It's always been there. But as crazy and wacky and out of control as things were at Atari because uh, the thing about Atari, the thing that made Atari so crazy was it was, I don't think it had ever happened before in history that in a commercial endeavor, one person could produce something as valuable as what we did. When you consider what it costs to have one developer, 
make a video game in like six months, you're talking like under $50,000 in most cases. And that creates a product that you can profit tens of millions of dollars on. Okay, so that leverage, right, spending $50,000 to make over 10 million or more, that's a very unusual situation. So in a situation like that, uh, part of the rate, you know, Nolan really got the idea that these people, because Nolan created the idea of charging all that money, right, for it. So he developed the idea of profitability, and he knew he had, like, the golden, you know, whatever, the egg layers, the geese. I never thought of goosing myself like that. So, he got that, and he put that out there. And then when Kazar came in, and when the Warner people showed up, and things were already taking off, what really happened was he came in and goes, ah, these are people who program, so what? We can get programmers. He actually said once, he says, the programmers, you guys are like towel designers. Because he came from Burlington, a textile manufacturer. Because you guys are towel designers, because you're a dime a dozen, we get all those. That comment started Activision. <laughs> because it wasn't, it wasn't true. You know? They said, okay, go ahead and do it. We'll go and be profitable for someone else. And Kazar still didn't get it, and they launched another company. Kazar was very good at getting people to split off and start other companies. And then he ended up paying a tremendous amount of money for the remaining program. So I was very happy to be part of the remains at that point. But uh, that concept is very unique. And as software development grew in scope and became more of a collaborative instead of an effort, instead of a work of authorship, uh, it wasn't as true that one person is creating an entity that's so valuable. Now it's more like teams and people were more replaceable. And I don't think that was an accident. Okay? The 2600 was a really difficult machine to program, which meant that in the world, for a while, there were maybe 50 to 100 people who could even do it. And of those, not all of them could do it well. You know, and by doing it well, I don't mean just meeting the tech specs, like I said before, being able to make a fun game. Because that's really what you needed to do. It didn't matter what your, it's not what your technical achievement is, it's what your saleable product is. Ultimately, that's what counts for the game, right? So to implement a spec, so like doing uh, knockoff, doing knockoffs, there you already have a clear spec to meet, and that's purely a technical challenge. Okay, to try and design and create a new game and make that fun and stuff, that's an even rarer skill. Okay, so one of the first things that happened after Atari, there were a lot of lessons that were learned from Atari. Probably the biggest lesson was what's a, a, a product life cycle? You know, what really happened at Atari? What happened at Atari was this was the first product life cycle and nobody knew anything, right? So they didn't know how to manage it, you know? And another problem was uh, the idea of creating uh, a licensing a lock on your system, right? Nobody had ever, it never occurred to anyone to do that. Nowadays, you know, anybody who puts out a base unit, they know that the only people they approve can put a game out on that unit. Not so with the 2600. So there were a lot of big lessons that were learned because it was the first time. And those lessons turned out to be very costly for the people who didn't quite get them initially. That's kind of meandering, but did that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes. Bill Short, how do you say the name of the engine on Yard Revenge? How do you pronounce that? I pronounce it Kotai. And where did that come from? I made it up. <laughs> I made it up. The naming of Yards. How many of you know the story of the naming of Yards Revenge? Not quite a few of you. Okay, so I won't bore you with all the details. But, uh, the name Yar and Razak were code for Ray Kazar, right? Those I did algorithmically, as they say. Uh, when it came to the other pieces in the game, I just made stuff up. And Kotile was born of the idea that I always thought it would be really cool. I always liked the idea of words that have a Q without a U after it. So Qatar or Qatar, I think, was always kind of an interesting country. Never went there, but I thought the spelling was interesting. But, uh, and so these are the quirky things. Like when I did yards, when I, think, I, have, I have my own little weird bucket list of things I want to accomplish in my life. One of those was to add a word to the English language. That's something I always wanted to do. And so when I was came to naming the stuff in Yards Revenge, it really did occur to me that, you know, whatever I make up, if this game becomes really popular, like Pac-Man or something like that, I would be creating a new concept, a new word that would pervade the English language perhaps, and I could, you know, 
this one off my bucket list. You know? So that was it, and Kotile was an effort to do that. The problem is when you try to make up a new word, I don't know if you've ever tried to make up a new word, pretty much everything sounds stupid. <laughs> and I just, I couldn't get past that. So with Kotile, all I did was I wanted to, something started with a Q and had no U. So that's, that was the genesis of that. Yes? Uh, quick question. So is there anything that you see in industry um, wide since the time, you know, you've been making games and everything and all the lessons to learn from Atari? Do you still see mistakes that are being made by more companies that you feel are kind of cringeworthy? Like, we went through this at Atari, why is this happening again? Specifically, I'm, I sort of think of like the Genesis era of Sega, their kind of rise and fall with Sega of America, and maybe there was lessons to learn from you guys, but they didn't actually learn it. And then just history repeating it. Well, yeah, that's true, but Sega had a good run. The thing is, the, the next generation, I mean, it was like, we were sort of the first generation. And, and then after that, people were trying to figure out, was this a fad or was it a real thing? Everybody who was in the business knew that games were a real thing. It wasn't just a fad. It was like a new style of entertainment, right? It was a new medium. And that was really cool. But like I said, that first product life cycle was very tough on people. So a lot of people did learn those lessons. So with Sega and Nintendo, and as they started to come in, they were wiser. They learned the lesson of Activision and, imagine, and the market getting just cluttered with all kinds of crap that anyone can throw out, no one can stop it from coming out. So there were some big lessons they did learn, okay? Lessons they didn't learn necessarily. Uh, I don't know if that was uh, Atari kind of stuff. I mean, you see people make mistakes in the industry all the time. And that's because, you know, business is a big, complex thing to do. And whenever you have a really complex system, what it means is there's a lot of ways to screw it up that you don't know about yet, right? And as the complexity increases, there's just more opportunities for that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story of a moment where I really realized how screwed up the mentality of some companies. Because I'll tell you, one thing that's left is the idea of innovation. Innovation in console, as console development moved forward, innovation has kind of dropped off. And there's good reason for that, business-wise, in terms of managing risk of investment. But it can be taken too far. And what, if there's one thing people didn't learn, it's how to be more realistic in your goals. Okay? It's one thing to try and do innovation. It's another thing to try and just move forward at a regular pace and grow your company at a regular rate. Those are reasonable things to do. But I was at Crystal Dynamics. You ever heard of Crystal Dynamics? So I actually went and interviewed there one time, and I was thinking of getting back into games. I got out of games for a while. And uh, so I went to Crystal Dynamics, and I interviewed with this guy, and it's like, you know, you know, he was a pretty nerdy-looking guy, but he was like management nerdy, not like cool tech nerdy. In my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and I'm sitting in the office with this guy, and we're trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do? And I'm like someone who has, you know, obviously known about game development, been involved in game development and stuff, and so most game companies are interested, particularly back then, in me, and he goes, so what would you do here? And I said, well, you know, I can do game design, and I like, so like to code, or I can at least manage coding processes, and I do some art consultation, and you know, most of the things you do in a game, you know, I, you know, I like to do that. He goes, well, okay, but that's too many. What are you gonna do here? And I said, well, I could do all that stuff. I said, was it? he goes, but what's your job going to be? And I'm like, you're the one with the jobs. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, where do you need help? And this guy was so focused on having a box to put me in. It didn't seem like he got the idea of, well, can you spot talent and incorporate that in your product? And that's a big mistake. When people aren't, don't know what it takes to do something, a lot of times it's hard for them to spot the people who are going to contribute. But that wasn't the best part of the interview. The best part of the interview, just before I got up and walked out, <laughs> when the guy says, I said, well, what are you trying to do here? And he goes, well, he goes, 
you know, we do the sports games. We do contract work for EA, and we do their sports games, and we do successive generations of that. He goes, because we need to make our 10 to 15% each year. We need to grow 10 to 15%. So we do that, we do our sports knockoffs, and he says, and what we're looking for is the big breakaway hit. And I said to him, I said, okay, so what you're saying is you want to keep doing incremental releases to the same game over and over again every year, and you're looking for the breakout hit. And he goes, yeah. And that's when I sort of got up and walked out, because I realized this guy doesn't have any idea what he's doing, right? And it's just, that's kind of a weird mentality. And you see that. You see that in companies, and particularly in games, in some way. People have license to be unreasonable, in some way. Because being unreasonable used to equate to breaking through and coming up with some sort of revolutionary uh, insight or technological innovation or design innovation. And that would be cool, and that would move the state of things forward. It was exciting. But now it's just about like being in fantasy land and not being realistic about what you're talking about and asking for. They were bringing you all here to do a knockoff and we want it to be the biggest thing ever. Huh, usually breakthrough things are new. And that didn't, it didn't seem to dawn on him. There was nothing that bothered him about that conversation. And that really bothered him. So I'd say that's a problem that you see in companies is uh, a diff difficulty in clarifying their goals and resolving what we're trying to do with how we're trying to do it. You know, and basically that's like in therapy. There's a saying I have in therapy that I share with some of my clients. <laughs> and that saying is, what I'm trying to do is get your head and your ass aligned in the same direction. And I don't care what direction that is, as long as they're both going in the same direction. But when a person is telling me they want one thing, but everything they do suggests they want something else, I know there's a problem, and I'm going to help them resolve that problem. Now, when, it, when that happens in a company, you can't always help them resolve that problem because they're committed to having their head and their ass moving in different directions, and they will do that until they fall off the financial cliff. And then those people will be out interviewing at other places. And that happens in games. Yes? Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, a um, who handled writing the instruction manuals? Was it like marketing, or was it you, or how much input you had in that? Um, uh, I had a good amount of input, particularly for my games, which tended to be <laughs> more complicated. So, uh, but I didn't write them. They had tech writers, they had people in marketing and market communications who put that stuff together. And we used to argue. We used to argue a lot, particularly with Raiders. Okay. Yours, there wasn't much argument. Yours was cool, although for Yours, I did write the story. You know, Yards was the first game that ever had a backstory. It was the first game to come out with a comic book. And I wrote that story. I wrote the story to get the game named the way it was. So I was trying to outmarket market market. And then when they decided to do that, okay, that was cool. And they put the thing and they wrote it. And they wrote up this thing. And when I saw the comic book, I thought, you took this story and you dumbed it down. Every, a lot of things they did, they would dumb things down. And I never understood that. And then just as a follow-on to what you were talking about a little bit ago, have you ever thought about breaking back into the homebrew scene? I am actually thinking about that more recently, although I'm not thinking about it in terms of sitting down and coding. But I do have, I, you know the game that I was going to do after Yars? I finally figured out, well I always knew what that was. I had that design right after Yars. And that was going to be Yarian Olympics. Right? It was, what it was going to be was this was going to be the training exercises that Yars go through to train them to go out and fight Kotan. So it fit story-wise, it was all there. And, uh, and I had a gameplay for it, but it relied on paddle controllers, and I was a little hinky about relying on paddle controllers, because that could hurt a game, because, you know, joysticks are much more popular, joysticks also work much better a lot of times, you know, they don't go bad as often. And nowadays, you know, you know how many of you have a 2600? How many of you have a joystick to go through 2600? Okay, how many of you have paddle controllers to go through 2600? <laughs> Still there, huh? Okay. How do you raise your hand if I ask you a question you agree? <laughs> Just check. Okay. So, so there was some interaction over there, and that was weird, but that was fine. But on Raiders, it was tough. Raiders was one where I 
I'm saying the whole point of the adventure game is they're supposed to figure this out. And they're supposed to find it out, and I don't want too many clues. And they said, nobody's ever going to figure this stupid game out. What are you doing? You know? It's like, we've got to put stuff in the manual. And I really fought them on that, and I lost, and they were totally right. You know, if we would have put out a manual with, like, no hints, then uh, that would have been a very rough way for people to engage Raiders. If you can't get into the game at all, you're not going anywhere. And this was pre-internet. A lot of what went on, you know, back then, you got to remember it's in the context of pre-internet. So there weren't cheat codes you could put out, there weren't groups, user groups that could all come together to, you know, share ideas and what's going on. You also, people couldn't band together and trash your game within three <laughs> hours of release. <laughs> there were advantages to it also. But uh, that was it, and then, but most, most of the games was a very smooth process and not a problem at all. Yeah, I was just thinking the bonus on ET that apparently never existed or something like that. I was like, who put this, like, that was the point bonus you had 32 candies or something like that. You never could find it. Well, handing candies to Elliot is the key to the signatures in ET, the Easter eggs. ET has the most Easter eggs of any game I ever did. Do you know the Easter eggs in ET? Most of them. Let's see, how many can we name? You know that you can find a yard that flies out of the well. You know how you get that? You give Elliot exactly seven Reese's Pieces, then go heal the flower. If Elliot has exactly seven Reese's Pieces when you heal the flower, that's when you get the yard on the first level. You come back and do it again on the second level, you get uh, Indiana Jones. You do it on the third level, you get the thing I put in every one of my games, which is an HSW with the number of the game. So in ET, it's HSW3. But wait, that's not all you get. You know the phone pieces in E.T.? Have you ever fallen into a well? Yeah. Have you ever fallen into a well and accidentally found a phone piece? If you look carefully at those phone pieces, you will notice that one of them is an H, one of them is an S, and one of them is a W. They're just screwed up a little bit. So I did that. Also, E.T., I think, is the only game I'm aware of that the graphic designer has a signature in. J.M.D., Jerome Michael Demura, who is no longer with us. Or a few words out. <laughs> I put a signature in for him. We were very close for a very long time. So it was tough losing him last year. It's even tougher on his signature. But he's uh, but that signature's in there. And the phone, when you assemble the phone, looks like ET. So I even gave E.T. a signature. <laughs> but there were a lot of Easter eggs in E.T. In five weeks, I wasn't going to leave out the Easter eggs. But I, 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 admit, I think I only spent like three hours on the Easter egg in the whole development. That was always my thing was I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time. I did the Easter eggs last. I didn't want to spend game space I could be using on something else for Easter eggs. I didn't think that was fair. But as time went on, it seemed like the Easter eggs were kind of a cool thing. So. I sort of knew it was part of the job, but the last part. But I did go nuts on for these two. Uh, I probably got time for one more question. Okay, let's hear both questions and we'll see how it goes. I've never done this before. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so um, right, right now you, you seem to be uh, kind of an icon right now. Like I mentioned the name Howard Scott Warshaw and people know who I'm talking about. I have the same thing. How that felt like you went from uh, being a uh, programmer at Atari, and I don't know how much uh, how much namesake you uh, had back then uh, as opposed to now. Well, back then there was virtually none. Although it is true that one of the first, there are many firsts in Yars Revenge that became standards. Yars Revenge was the first Atari game that went out with the name of the programmer on it in the documentation. And so that was cool, but that didn't get me much name recognition. You know, most people did not know my name. Whereas today, very few people know my name. Okay? But it's still probably more than it used to be. But you know, I'm very comfortable with the idea of people knowing my name. But the transition, I will share this with you because I think it's kind of a cute thought, is the idea, I think all my thoughts are cute. <laughs> but the, people think it's odd to be, make the transition from a programmer to a therapist. Like they go, what? You know, Why you do that? You know? Because they don't see programmers as people with people skills. And I understand why. 
they don't see programmers as people with people skills. And I was a very high people skill person for a programmer. That's true. But I don't look at it as a big transition or a big change. The fact is that programmers and therapists were all systems analysts, right? It's just that therapists work on much more sophisticated hardware. So think about that. And we are out of time. So I am going to go up and do some autographing. I will have Once Upon Atari's up there available for purchase if you'd like those. I'll be up there in just a few minutes. Thank you very much for coming. And this